And we have a special guest with us here in Mission Control Houston today, uh, two-time long-duration space flyer Peggy Whitson, uh, as mentioned, an accomplished biochemist in her own right uh, with a, a degree from uh, Rice University in uh, biochemistry. Uh, Peggy, welcome. It's great to be here today. We're glad to have you on Space Station Live, and, and the reason we're talking with you today is we're talking about microencapsulation. Uh, and I'm going to let you explain it, but the reason we're talking about microencapsulation is because uh, we did a countdown of the 10 top research uh, results and experiments on the International Space Station. We're getting ready to recognize the 15-year anniversary yeah. of the first element launch. Uh, you were one of the early Space Station crew members on Expedition 5, uh, and you worked with the microencapsulation experiment on orbit. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, actually, the microencapsulation experiment on orbit um, was actually, from a crew member perspective, relatively simple. We we just put in these canisters and activated them, and what we were doing is building these little, basically, bubbles uh, that can be used in uh, technology as either deli delivering drugs and and various different techniques for uh, application here on the Earth. But we were just trying to build the bubbles and understand what what makes them uh, uh, how to make them the best way and the most effectively and so we were using the lack of gravity as our tool to see what other variables can influence how these uh, little capsules can be made here on Earth, which is great for us because, you know, uh, up on orbit we can we can test these things out and find out all the nuances of the different things that influence making these capsules. And what's really, I, I know it's been since Expedition 5, and that seems like a long time ago, but that's actually kind of how research runs, especially research that involves human beings. Uh, you know, it's taken this many years to get uh, these capsules to the point where we're going to actually try and test them here on Earth uh, to carry, in some cases, they're going to carry markers that can be used then to, uh, by the doctors to visualize where the cancers might be located so the, the capsules will go and know how to attack and, and, and attach to a particular type of cancer. And then the d doctors can visualize that cancer better because the bubbles inside will have little fluorescent or marker beads that can actually be visualized and the doctors can attack it directly by using ultrasound to visualize it and inject things. It's also a plan for future uses where you would actually uh, put drugs inside those little bubbles and they would then attack the cancers directly. So it's really exciting that we, we're getting to that phase where we're taking something that we, we tested out on orbit, found out how to optimize making these little capsules on the ground by taking out gravity as a variable, and now we can we can test something in human beings that hopefully will have a future for us uh, in helping to cure cancers, or not so much cure cancers, but to help us fight more effectively cancers as they, as they grow in our bodies. Well, and that could also, as I understand the way they're hoping to use this in drug delivery, help make cancer treatments a lot less hard to deal with for the patient. Right now, you pretty much pollute the entire body with the anti-cancer chemical. This allows you to pollute just the area that you really want to target. Yes, that's a, a very good point. So it, it'll be very much a targeted drug delivery mechanism. So it's very exciting. But human research uh, does take years, uh, especially from the concept, the idea, and then to get it to where we're actually testing it uh, in, in human beings. It, it does take years, and that's that's standard here on the ground when we're doing research, it takes that long. But it's very exciting that something that began on the uh, International Space Station has come this far. Well, so tell us, uh, as a biochemist, are there any other experiments that are particularly uh, interesting in your view uh, that have come out of space station research? Oh, well. <laughs> I, I have lots of favorites that I've I've worked on over the years uh, doing different uh, research. But the ones that are most appealing to me uh, are the ones where the crew member gets to interact the most. You know, we do a lot of crystallization, but mostly that's activating and starting an experiment. And zero gravity is the variable that causes these things to happen independent of the crew member. So for a, from a crew member perspective, the ones that are most interesting are the ones where we get to actually be involved and be a part of the experiment. Uh, one of the more interesting ones for me, I, again, that illustrates 
why we do research in an environment like the space station was an in-space experiment where we were looking at this um, uh, colloidal suspension of iron particles in a magnetic field. And one day I turned the magnetic field or the mag uh, magnetic electromagnetic field and set it at the wrong setting because my eyes were getting a little old and I missed the decimal point. Instead of 20 hertz, it was two, <laughs> dec two decimal zero. And uh, we saw a very different response to what they'd seen on the ground. And so once we finished up the experiments at 20 hertz, we went back and repeated them at 2 hertz uh, so the investigators would have this whole new data set that we just by accident found on orbit. And a lot of times, research in the laboratory here on the ground, the, the most interesting research is, I wonder why that happened. <laughs> and you go and try and figure out, why did that happen? Well, serendipity was always my best friend when I was doing any kind of a research <laughs> for uh, my college degree. Yeah, And you know, Mike Hopkins was working with the in-space experiment yesterday. Uh, he had uh, some extra time, and he was able to pull that together and, and do some work in the microgravity glove box. So it's obviously still a favorite up there, because you can see things happening. Right, yeah, and it's a lot of fun because the crew members are very involved and they have to set up things and you get to watch what's happening at the time. And so from a crew member perspective, those are the fun ones to do. I liked, enjoyed doing the ultrasound. We were using developing ultrasound technology uh, and distance telemedicine techniques to uh, utilize this technology for remote medicine on board the space station, but obviously that, that could apply here on Earth in remote rural locations where you might not have an expert uh, ultrasound technologist, but you could do some remote guidance from somewhere else and have the experts look at the data and tell you, you know, what, what might be the problem. So all of this is great application for us going on beyond, uh, you know, low Earth orbit and doing exploration in the future, but it's really neat that it actually does apply here on the ground as well. Definitely, we're looking at the benefits for humanity from the International Space Station. I want to thank you, Peggy Whitson, for coming to visit with us today. We appreciate you. Great taking uh, time out of your day uh, and to share your expertise with research and your experience on board the International Space Station. Peggy no problem. Whitson, thank no you. problem. It's a lot of fun. Glad to share.